high speed. Hour and a half, you said. All right. He says we'll keep the topic to hour and a half. <laughs> questions and answers afterwards. And um, that will be the history in itself. So please give me a warm welcome to the genocide. <laughs> Okay, um, hello everyone. Hello. Uh, most of you know who I am, I'm Keanu. Uh, when Lynette called me and asked if I could give a presentation on this day, I thought about what day this is called Admissions Day. And instead of me giving the same, should I say title? <laughs> I still have a lot of the same substance, but the same title. I thought, well, let's take a look at what actually is the state of Hawaii, okay? And, uh, for those of you who don't know, my background is I have a political science PhD in specializing in international relations and public law. Uh, <coughs> published a few larger articles and peer review articles and publications that speak to these topics. Okay, so I'm not here to kind of give you a take on my view. It's actually what we teach at the university, right? And a lot of it is just based upon terminology definitions, theoretical framework, all these kind of things which I'm going to try to put together uh, in this talk. Okay, so I'm not here to bash the state of Hawaii. I'm not here to bash anything, but I'm here to explain something which will start to make everything understandable, right? That's the key. Um, I work for the state of Hawaii, okay, the armed force. I'm a faculty member at the University of Hawaii, and everybody is caught in this situation. It's like a web. And you cannot claim you're not in it. It's a web. And if one moves, one person moves, everybody moves. Okay? So there are issues that need to be understood, but the problem is we tend to have walked into situations on a preconceived notion of what we think. Right? Uh, we already have formed biases when, I look, when we look at something, and then we tend to confirm that bias by cherry picking from history from laws, from facts to support it, okay? And how you maintain that bias, it's actually a term called communal reinforcement. You, you connect yourselves together with people who think the same and you keep reinforcing the bias, right? Uh, another people say it's called gang mentality. And then when somebody comes in or somebody within that entity starts to question certain issues, certain facts, then what ends up happening is this phenomenon takes place. People within that entity turn on that person and kick them off, right? And that is a phenomenon that gets into so many different things. Uh, people watch CNN today, you hear a lot what is called tribalism, okay? That's the new politics, right? And tribalism, you got Trumpism, tribal. You got people who are viewing Trump in one way, others in another way, but they come from a tribal standpoint. And these tribes tend to reinforce their own opinion and then set themselves up against others and that when you present the facts, it's almost as if nobody's even listening because they're all going back to their tribes. Yeah? So that's what's being played out <laughs> on CNN, Fox News, uh, MSNBC, and everything else. Okay? So we take that idea and now you throw Hawaii in there and we're walking in with people's prejudice already. People think that Hawaii is a particular entity. They think or assume that it is this system exists. And anything challenging them, right, uh, they tend to um, identify, isolate, and expel, right? Whether you get attacked, right, politically, physically, whatever the case is, these are all symptoms of tribalism, right? So don't think we don't have that in Hawaii, <laughs> okay? Now for me, as a political scientist, I'm just telling you what it is, whether you like it or not, because that's just the way it is. What I'm here to do is to provide some understanding of what it is, and then people are still gonna only take what they wanna take, and then confirm what they already think they know, and then may not get even what I even said. Now in light of all of that, it's okay. I've been actually giving these talks for years. <laughs> and the one thing that's important is that our history and the understanding of our history is not dependent upon how we interpret it. Actually, history should be self-evident. 
History should be self-evident for what it is, not what somebody says it is, right? And there are ways of explaining history that resonate what it was at that particular time. We have to be careful is we don't want to judge yesterday by today's standard, right? We want to try to understand what was the standard at that particular time and then track its evolution, okay? So right off the bat, provisional government to state of Hawaii, many people in Hawaii don't even know what the provisional government is <coughs> unless they took history classes. And only, I would say, within the last 20 or, so, or odd years, the provisional government became a part of Hawaii's history. Prior to that, like if you ask my dad, went to St. Louis, he had no idea what the provisional government was. He had no idea what the Republic of Hawaii was. All he knew was state of Hawaii, and when he, my dad was born in 1939, so when he was 20 years old, 1959, all he saw was the state of Hawaii from the territory of Hawaii, okay? Um, people today are now being educated. They're learning at the university. They're learning in the high schools. They're learning at the entry level schools of elementary, intermediate. It's a different narrative that is coming up. And what's happening is you're starting to see, and I've seen it, school children, no more than their parents, okay? And that in of itself can create tension, right? So I just wanna point out there's a lot of issues regarding Hawaii's history, right? But I'm gonna to try to simplify it enough where we're gonna talk about this one thing. From the provisional government to the state of Hawaii. Let's start off with this. There was a court case, state of Hawaii versus Dennis Kaulia. It was a criminal case that originated in the Third Circuit Court in Kona. Okay. And it went on appeal before the Hawaii Supreme Court. And in its decision, something stood out. Whatever may be said regarding the lawfulness of its origins, the state of Hawaii is now a lawful government. Okay. Well, that's pretty bold and audacious on the point where why, did you, why do you have to even say that? Isn't it assumed the state of Hawaii is a lawful entity? That's an assumption, right? But he had to make that point. Well, I was actually involved in that case. Right? I was uh, contacted by the attorney for Dennis Kauli. In fact, Dennis saw me in Kona. He said, hey, Dr. Sai, can you help me with my case? Because we deal with jurisdiction, subject matter jurisdiction. I said, yeah, you got an attorney? Yeah, told me the guy's name. I said, him, tell him to call me. So he called, we spoke over the phone. Uh, sent in the motion to dismiss subject matter jurisdiction, which will show that the Hawaiian kingdom exists. And the way it explains it exists is for this attorney to know it uses two court cases that the state of Hawaii Intermediate Court of Appeals had already established as precedent in 1994. And those two cases are called State of Hawaii versus Lorenzo and Nishitani versus Baker, okay? In fact, I know both Tony Lorenzo and Fred Baker. I didn't really know the cases, though, until I got into that legal aspect. Now, in State of Hawaii versus Lorenzo, uh, in 1992, Tony Lorenzo got into an accident. He didn't have a license. He belonged to a sovereignty group that his dad was claiming to be a king, right? And he got into the accident and he fled the scene. Well, he was picked up, went on trial, and fleeing the scene of a crime, of an accident, and he submitted in trial a motion to dismiss. He was claiming immunity as a citizen of the Hawaiian kingdom, okay? Now, terminology, citizen of the Hawaiian kingdom. That is a contradiction. I don't know if that's how it was written by the attorney, but you cannot be a citizen in a monarchy. You can only be a citizen in a non-monarchy. And if you are a national of a monarchy, it's called a subject, right? Like British subjects. Now, you can, that can be called a citizenry, a citizenry, but the term itself, subject, is a monarchy, so it would really be a subject of the kingdom. That's, that's how it's supposed to be. So give you an example. Um, my great-grandfather, born in 1880, William Kuakini Cyruson, was a Hawaiian subject, right? That's what his nationality is. 
Now, when the so-called provisional government was formed, they claimed to be not a monarchy. They claimed to be actually an oligarchy, but it was a republic. They turned themselves into a republic. A republic is not a monarchy. So you start to see people in control of, the, of this group called the Republic of Hawaii. They refer to themselves as Hawaiian citizens, not Hawaiian subjects. You guys see the terminology? And its applicability in our history. That, that's what I'm pointing out. Okay. So he was claiming to be a citizen, or I would say a subject, of the Hawaiian kingdom of his father's group. Right? Well, his motion was denied and he was convicted. It went on appeal to the Intermediate Court of Appeals and it reached there in 1994, one year after the Apology Resolution of 1993. President Clinton signed the Apology Resolution, right? Now, in 1994, Judge Walter Heen was one of the three judges that sat on the case. And Judge Heen wrote the opinion, wrote the judgment. And he said, basically, the reason why Lorenzo lost his case was because he provided no factual or legal basis that the Hawaiian kingdom continues to exist as a state. And he used the word state, not the Hawaiian kingdom as a government, a state. So he lost his case. Nishitani versus Baker is another case that came up two years later in 1996. And the Intermediate Court of Appeals in that case, three other judges, I don't know who was the one who signed off on the, on the opinion, or the judgment, but they said that according to a particular Hawaii Vice Statutes, it is the burden of the defendant to present evidence that the Hawaiian kingdom exists as a state in order for the judge to consider the evidence. Does that make sense? Right? And that's a statute. It says the defendant has to put that forward. But Nishitani versus Baker said it is still the duty and obligation of the prosecution to prove that it has jurisdiction to prosecute. So here is the prosecution having the duty to prove that it can prosecute, meaning it has jurisdiction. And it also said that it is up to the defendant to present evidence so the judge can consider that argument whether or not the prosecution has jurisdiction. Okay, so that's how these two cases were paired up. Okay. Since 1994 till today, any case that goes before a state court, they rule against the defendants and they cite State of Hawaii versus Lorenzo, Nishitani versus Baker, and then a whole bunch of others that follow, right? But it goes back to State of, Loren State of Hawaii versus Lorenzo, Nishitani versus Baker. Well, in this case here, uh, well, let me go back to uh, that idea of uh, dismissing based upon Lorenzo and Baker. Prior to that, people were going into the courts, not showing any factual or legal basis that the Hawaiian kingdom continues to exist as a state, they've only gone in with statements of who they are. People went in claiming to be prime ministers, people went in to claim to be ambassadors, people claim to be this and claim to be that. According to State of Hawaii versus Lorenzo, they haven't provided evidence, factual or legal, that the Hawaiian kingdom exists as a state. So by claiming to be whatever you want to be, in their eyes, the state courts were saying, motion denied pursuant to Lorenzo, right? You haven't provided the evidence, you're just making statements, right? Well, back then, nobody even knew what a state was as opposed to the government. Because the 1993 apology resolution was over apologizing for an overthrow. If they're apologizing for an overthrow, what, were, what was overthrown? Because if the Hawaiian kingdom was overthrown as a state, then why did the Intermediate Court of Appeals say you got to provide some factual legal basis that the Hawaiian kingdom as a state continues to exist? What was actually overthrown in 1893 was the government, not the state. And how you explain the state exists, well, you have to show international law. 
because that's what the state is. It's a subject of international law. And the uh, State of Hawaii versus Lorenzo stated that you must provide a factual legal basis that the Hawaiian Kingdom exists as a state in accordance with recognized attributes of a state's sovereign nature. That's all international law. Well, nobody knew international law at that time. They were just claiming Hawaiian Kingdom, Hawaiian Kingdom. Some were saying Kingdom of Hawaii. Some were saying other kingdoms, right? Nobody was using international law. Now, once um, I got involved with two attorneys, we began to separate the waters. Okay? So in my doctor dissertation, a section of my doctor dissertation actually covered State of Hawaii versus Lorenzo. And Judge Walter Heen was actually an informal member of my doctoral committee. So I would meet with him. So after I got my doctorate in 2008, in 2009, I had a lunch meeting with Judge Walter Heen at Zippy's in Kahalo, him and his wife. And I basically, after all the pleasantry, pleasantries were exchanged and we had breakfast, I said, Judge Heen, I need to ask you this question. When this case came before you in 1994, and the attorney for, for uh, Lorenzo, who by the way at the time was Cully Watson, okay, he's on the record as the attorney. If Cully Watson gave you my doctoral dissertation to show evidence that the Hawaiian Kingdom exists as a state, what would you have done? And he said, I would have uh, uh, granted the appeal and overturned the decision by the court. I said, really? He says, he admitted to me back then, he didn't really understand the difference between a state and a government, but because he read my doctor dissertation and was sitting as an informal member of my committee, he said, I got it. It makes perfect sense. So then I said, well, that's 2009. I said, well, I'm gonna start working with some attorneys because you folks opened the door to provide evidence that the Hawaiian Kingdom continues to exist as a state. And uh, I'm gonna be working with two attorneys, Dexter Kayama and uh, Keone Agar. And we're gonna close the door. And he smiled at me. He said, ooh, that's gonna get interesting. Because what we're going to show is we're not gonna seek personal jurisdiction, personal immunity, right, over the person, which is what Lorenzo was doing. Because when you seek personal immunity, it's like you're saying I'm part of another government, but you don't have jurisdiction over me. Okay? Like claiming diplomatic immunity. I told Judge Walter Heen, we're going to be addressing subject matter jurisdiction, not personal immunity or personal jurisdiction. We're gonna show that the court itself cannot exist. That's what we're gonna show, okay? And he said, hmm, yeah. well in 2010, Three years before this, that's when I met up with Dennis Kaulia and began to talk to his attorney. So I provided him the motion to dismiss on subject matter jurisdiction. Now whenever you submit a motion to dismiss, you set up an evidentiary hearing, a hearing where you provide evidence, evidence that the other side can attack, right, to support your case. And the attorney in the criminal trial sought to have me admitted as an expert witness. The judge and the prosecution said no. Now here's the problem. If I'm coming in as an expert witness because it is incumbent on the defendant to prevent evidence that the Hawaiian Kingdom exists as a state according to State of Hawaii versus Lorenzo and Nishitani versus Baker, then how can the judge in this case say, no, we're not gonna let you bring evidence in? And then they ruled against them. It went on appeal, Intermediate Court of Appeals, they affirmed the lower court's decision, and then it went up to the Supreme Court in 2013, and that is the basis, the, the, the foundation of that statement right there. And if you read the decisions, I'm actually in it, Dr. Keanu Sai, <laughs> being denied by the prosecution and the judge from being an expert witness. So whatever may be said regarding the lawfulness of its origins, the state of Hawaii is now a lawful government. Can you now understand why they're making that statement? 
it's no longer an assumption because that, uh, that assumption has been falsified. And what they're doing is they're circling the wagons. And today, courts use State of Hawaii versus Kaulia along with State of Hawaii versus Lorenzo and Ishitani versus Baker to deny motions to dismiss. But now they can say, we're not even letting any evidence come in to even consider it. Now that is problematic for a judicial system in what is supposed to be a lawful state of Hawaii. Because why would you get that type of statement if it's a legal issue and it's a done deal that the state of Hawaii exists as a legal entity? Whatever may be said of its origins. Well, two things resonate. First, what is the state of Hawaii's origin, right? Second, what is considered a lawful government? That's what's coming out of that statement. Well, to be a lawful government, you either have to be de jure or de facto, right? De jure, de jure, silent J, you can say the J, Jesus, Jesus, right? De jure is lawful, meaning a government that has come about through lawful means, constitutional amendment, whatever the case is. De facto is not just in fact, See, in law, a de facto government is a successful revolution. You succeeded in revolting against the former government. So the United States of America became a de facto government in 1783 when they succeeded in their revolution. It took them seven years to get King George III to recognize them as 13 independent states. Prior to that, they were neither de jure or de facto, but rather insurgents who were fighting for their independence. That's the difference. So, this is what a lawful government is. You have the de facto successful revolution or your lawful entity. Okay, so with that, let's begin to delve into who is the state of Hawaii. Well, today's perception is that Hawaii is the 50th state since 1959. When you ask some people, and I've asked many, I said, do you know how the state of Hawaii came about? Nobody knows. They just go, uh, I don't know. Do see where it came from. The predecessor of the state of Hawaii was called the Territory of Hawaii. It was formed in 1900. And the predecessor of the Territory of Hawaii was the Republic of Hawaii. It was formed in 1894. And the Republic of Hawaii was the successor of the provisional government, which claimed to have overthrown by revolution the Hawaiian Kingdom of government. That's the narrative. So here we have the Hawaiian Kingdom government, a fully constitutional system, executive, legislative, and judicial, separation of powers. Monarch is not absolute, it's an executive monarch, no different than what we would call a governor or president today. Right? The chief executive, in the Hawaiian Kingdom, she would be called the, or he would be called the executive monarch. 1893, all that changed was a name and the name of the executive officer. Right? From provisional government, name, to renaming <coughs> the office of the monarch president. Changed the name to the Republic in 1894, maintained the name of the executive called president, and territory changed from the Republic. They changed it from president to now governor, and then it changed from territory to state, state of Hawaii. Okay. Now, what actually has happened since then, in 18, since 1893, was no change in the governmental structure. Just renamed. That's all it is. Okay. So what is the authority of the state of Hawaii? It actually goes back to the Statehood Act of 1959. Public Law 86-3. Okay. So this is an act to provide for the admission of the state of Hawaii into the Union. Now this is kind of a misnomer here. Okay. The state of Hawaii was not admitted into the United States. The state of Hawaii was admitted as a state of the Union. That's different. Because you can be a territory within the United States and not be a state. Right? Puerto Rico, Guam, Virgin Islands, American Virgin Islands, Samoa. Right? Those are territories. This is merely saying that you're now in the Union, but you had to have been within the United States before 
that could take place. Every state, except for the original 13 colonies, which became states, every state thereafter used to be territories until they changed to states of the Union. And be mindful of, this is not a state under international law. This is a state within U.S. constitutional law that only applies to its territory. So the 1959 Statehood Act is a municipal law of the United States Congress. Okay? 